Awesome. Thank you guys so much for the warm welcome. My name is Junya Panich, and I'm the product manager for our stream processing platform. What is our stream processing platform? It's what powers Golden Signals um, with Beam. So just to give you a sense of what we'll cover today, we'll share a little bit behind the how and why of the platform, and then we'll go into a deep dive on our use case. So to help ground you, I want to talk about the problem space for a minute. Intuit provides financial software, which you can see in the products behind me. And we serve individuals, small businesses, self-employed. We really believe that finan finances are a universal challenge for everyone. And so to that end, our mission is to power prosperity around the world. How do we do that? Uh, we believe that AI and data-driven solutions are going to help us connect customers with the right information at the right time so that they can earn more money and save time. To give you a concrete example, we've built an AI data-driven expert platform, which connects people with experts so that they can ask questions unique to their own financial situations. To power something like this, we need tools like the stream processing platform. So let's talk a little bit about the origin story. Before the stream processing platform, we were processing data in batches. So we had high data, uh, low data availability, high costs. Each team was building their own custom integrations, both with monitoring, logging. It was quite, quite a big, um, it took a quite a long time to actually get a streaming application up and running. After the platform, we've had a number of benefits, uh, the most obvious being high data availability, but we're also really impressed that we've been able to see the time it takes to bring a streaming application in production down from six sprints down to two. Just to put it in a different way, if we think about our customer, the data engineer, they're trying to power in-app personalized experiences so they're really focused on the top of the iceberg. As a platform, we help operationalize that for them. We give them code out of the box. We set up their monitoring for them. And we also set up the infrastructure for them so that they have the building blocks to really get up and running as they're developing their applications. Just to talk through a number of just high level key features of the platform, we offer push button pipeline management so you can get your streaming applications components up and running quickly. We manage the infrastructure, as I mentioned. We provide out of the box starter code uh, through a GitHub repo. We offer lots of flexibility, both in the runner and the languages that you can use. And then we're heavily integrated into the Intuit system. So that is a high level overview of the platform itself. I'm going to turn it over to Nick, who will actually walk you through the developer experience. OK, thanks, Dunya. Uh, my name is Nick Huang. I am the engineering manager of the stream processing platform and here to talk to you about the developer experience. So we're approaching. Uh, close to 200 production use cases on SVP right now. And when we say developer, we mean, generally speaking, primarily data engineers, data scientists, machine learning engineers. Uh, but we have aspirations, which you can ask us about later, for uh, targeting more of the analyst persona. But we'll walk through what the experience looks like today uh, for these folks. First, a little bit of nomenclature. We um, have our developers provision two different types of assets on our platform, uh, a processor and a pipeline. A processor is a piece of code. Basically, you can think of it as a library. Um, so it's everything you need to capture the business logic and code for your stream processing application. The pipeline is what you, um, you wrap your processors into uh, to do a cloud deployment. So it represents the cloud deployment configuration and the infrastructure that comes along to actually run your pipeline in the cloud. Um, so as you can see here, processors uh, will be designed to talk to a variety of data sources and syncs. Since we are the stream processing platform, our data input is generally a Kafka input topic um, and also generally a Kafka output topic. But there are plenty of use cases that involve persisting to data at rest, such as um, the data lake on S3 or some kind of database um, that powers your use case. So with this framework of pipelines and processors, our developers can compose very interesting pipeline topologies. So let's walk through a couple examples. Uh, up on the top 
um, up, uh, <laughs> right for you. Um, if you remember your circuits in electrical engineering, uh, we've got uh, serial composition of processors. So an example here is uh, you've got one piece of code that perhaps does some filtering or basic sanitation of a input topic and then publishes to an intermediate Kafka topic that may be useful to some other use cases. Um, so they don't have to do the same filtering and processing. And then in the same deployment um, of a pipeline, you would have a second piece of code running that reads from this intermediate topic and then does maybe like a windowed aggregation or something and then publishes that to the ultimate output topic um, that actually powers your use case. Compare this to the example you see below, which is a more parallel composition of processors. So here you might have processor, processors that don't really talk with each other, but they still comprise a logical use case and a logical deployment, and you want to release and deploy these things together. So we see uh, a lot of examples of developers on our platform um, shipping a lot of the same processor, but with little tweaks and runtime configuration to perhaps read from a different input topic and publish to a different output topic or filter on a slightly different thing, but they still want to deploy these as a fleet and manage them as a fleet um, uh, of applications. So now that you've got the nomenclature out of the way, you can see our experience. So we think of it as happening in three phases, the authoring of the stream processor, the composition of processors into a pipeline, and then finally deploying the pipeline into the cloud. So let's first talk about authoring. So all um, uh, the experience for uh, SPP starts with a web application at Intuit that we call DevPortal. And it's the home of many what we call self-serve paved roads. What's a self-serve paved road? So it's basically a turnkey user experience to provision everything that you need to develop a certain type of thing um in the cloud so you can see up at the top we've got a paved road for web services we've got a paved road for serverless applications built on lambda and what we'll be talking about is the paved roads for data processors and data pipelines so a developer would come to this dev portal and then click on create data processor they would fill out a bunch of pretty rudimentary information about their uh, use case just what do you want to call this asset and what team do you work on for the purposes of asset management and uh, billing um, processors don't incur a lot of cost, but you'll see that's more important for pipelines. And then when you click create, you get a bunch of stuff out of the box. So first you get a GitHub repository that is pre-populated with a hello world example built around Beam and more specifically an SDK that we've built around Beam, uh, which long story short, our SDK makes it easy to interact with all the kind of Intuit versions of uh, Kafka and our metric store. Um, so you've got this nice hello world example in your GitHub repo already. You're provisioned a Jenkins build pipeline uh, and a bunch of artifactory repositories that you can publish um, your code to. So now that you've got this, you can start uh, building your stream processor. Uh, we actually heard a question in the Adobe talk about what does it look like for local testing and development. So here's a little bit of a picture of how folks do it at Intuit today. So you've got a couple options, but all of them really involve running your uh, stream processing code um, that generally written in Java at Intuit using our SDK, like I mentioned, that's wrapped around Beam and then running it on the Beam direct runner. Um, some folks like to have a completely local instantiation of Kafka running so that they've got some load generator running on their laptop, producing synthetic data to an input topic, and then the Beam direct runner deployment reads from this and then publishes to um, also a local topic. And then they'll be running some kind of local validation script to kind of do some integration testing um, that the data processor is doing, in fact, what they want. We also have a cloud-hosted um, Kafka cluster that we call our QA environment that's hosted in the Intuit cloud, and you can interact with it from your local laptop. So um, some folks uh, prefer to use that because it's a more test-like fly experience, right? You're actually interacting with um, across the network, uh, a Kafka cluster like you would in pre-production or production. But yeah, some folks also want to develop locally. Say you're flying on the plane to Beam Summit and you're trying to get your demo ready and you want to be completely disconnected, you have the option to do that um, if you've got a local setup. All right, so now you've got a stream processor and you're ready to put this in the cloud and actually see if it can talk to all your dependencies the way that you want. So this is where we compose the processors into pipelines. So again, you come back to Dev Portal. Now you would create a data pipeline asset. So same thing as before, fill out some basic information. As I mentioned, the billing uh, uh, attribution to a team here is particularly important because this is where you're gonna start racking up a bill pretty quickly. Um, and then you click create and you get all sorts of goodies. So we'll take a minute to talk through all of the things here. 
First thing to note is Intuit's an AWS shop. So we will provision a namespace for you on uh, AWS EKS, so Amazon's hosted Kubernetes service. And this is where your processors are going to run inside this namespace. Um, we also provision a lot of uh, pre-configured tooling for you to monitor, observe, uh, introspect your pipeline. So we've got logging from standard out and standard error all wired to go to Splunk, <clears throat> our log query engine. And we've got a help, helpful uh, link here to take you directly to Splunk with the query pre-populated to look at your pipelines, um, stack traces and output. We have um, routing using our BMS DK uh, to, to send metrics from your stream processing pipeline to our metric store, Wavefront. We also have a pre-populated dashboard, which we'll show you later, that's linked to on this user experience. We've got cost tracking tools based on QuickSense. And we also have, um, uh, we also write to a data catalog at Intuit that's powered by Apache Atlas, which will let people discover information about your pipeline and the data sets that it produces and data sets that it reads from. And this is a very important part of our data mesh strategy here at Intuit, uh, to let people discover lineage and understand where data comes from. And finally, when you uh, first click deploy on your pipeline, you're going to get a Flink cluster um, that powers your uh, that powers your pipeline, along with an S3 bucket that has checkpoints and save points um, that Flink needs for fault tolerance. Um, uh, so yeah, those are, so these are all the things that come out of the box for you. Now, you would um, click on Manage the first time you see this to start composing your processors into pipelines. So here's an example of a real world use case that we have at Intuit. The picture on the left is actually the topology that you see configured here. We won't go through it in much detail, but suffice to say, you can have very complicated spider webs of um, input topics and output topics and how these processors talk to them. So we go row by row and add processors and you can see each of these processors is linked to a particular uh, release in Artifactory for a version of a piece of code that somebody wants to run. And you can see also that it's configured with um, possibly varying resources assigned to each processor. Now clicking edit on each one of these lets you really fine tune them. So this is where you can play with a number of replicas and parallelism um, in a particular processor. We talked about the resource settings. You can also have a more or less free text um, space to apply special beam level configurations, flink level configurations, or even um, runtime configurations that you define specifically for your application. So here you can see someone's overriding a lot of the default checkpointing characteristics for uh, Beam on top of Flink to, you know, play around with the checkpointing intervals and things like that. Um, so after all this, you're ready to click deploy and move on to the next phase. So deploying your pipeline. The first thing you do is you'll uh, go through what we jokingly refer to as the five stages of grief sometimes, but you watch your pipeline uh, get to the cloud. And uh, my colleague Omkar will talk a little bit more about what's actually in the Argo workflow that um, executes all these steps. But um, what you just need to take away from here is that we take the developer along for the ride and just show them kind of the status and like why it takes uh, a long time sometimes. Uh, sometimes up to several minutes, depending on if you're provisioning new nodes to run your pipeline. But after it completes, you can come back to this heads-up display and see uh, everything that's been provisioned in Kubernetes for you. So again, my colleague Omkar will talk about what exactly the topology of the Kubernetes deployment is, but you can see the status of all your pods here, how long they've been running for, also how many times they've been restarted. So um, that is a high-level indicator of pipeline health. So as an example, here you can see that the job manager has restarted several times since deployment, and we'll probably want to check out why that is and if there's anything suspicious. So here you can see we pre-populate a link to Splunk um, to the approximate time range of the last pod restart. So if you click on this, you come over to your Splunk interface, you can see the stack traces relevant to uh, that you know, purported failure around that time, and you can see for yourself uh, kind of what the behavior was here. In addition to this, um, you can come back and click on the Wavefront dashboard. And here you can see um, more or less a pre-populated Wavefront dashboard that we give uh, for every pipeline. Um, so we, we pre-populate pre a few panels here like Kafka in and out so you can kind of see your input and output TPS and also consumer lag. And there's also a bunch of um, good dashboards for resource consumption on the Kubernetes um, pods. But uh, through our SDK that's wrapped around Beam, 
developers can also emit custom metrics. So you can see here in the kind of bottom middle panel that someone has decided to emit a custom metric for the latency it takes to sessionize a bunch of quickstream data. Um, so they can uh, develop their own um, metrics, create their own panel for visualization, and also set up their own alerts uh, to page their team if something starts going haywire. So that's the web experience, but I want to close this section by saying that's not the only way that customers interact with our platform. We have our native web experience built around Dev Portal, but we also have an API that powers that web experience, and a lot of developers interface with the API directly. So they can do interesting things like do GitOps type of CI CD workflows uh, with their pipelines or do local scripting to automate redeploys um, of their fleets of pipelines. We also have what we would call third party platforms built upon our platform. So using our API and building their own user experience. So a couple of examples, we have a feature management platform here at Intuit that is built upon SVP where it really makes it easy for a data scientist or machine learning engineer to author real-time features on the real-time platform, uh, but they'll have a separate UI and everything kind of automatically happens on an SVP pipeline in the background. Similarly speaking, like I mentioned, there's a lot of use cases for materializing um, streams and Kafka to the data lake and to queryable tables. And so we've got a couple of platforms built up on SVP to do just this and make it easy for folks to onboard new Kafka topics to this stream materialization. Um, so that concludes the overview of the developer experience. And now my uh, friend Omkar will talk about um, the guts of the platform and how it all works from within. Thanks, Nick. My name is Omkar Deshpande. Uh, I'm an engineer on stream processing platform. Um, we are going to uh, go through our design, our architecture. Uh, so this is the uh, iceberg that we saw earlier. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on just uh, the application layer or the beam code, uh, the runner layer, which is Flink, and then the infra layer, which is EKS. So uh, first, let's talk about the beam layer. Um, as Nick alluded to earlier, uh, vast majority of our uh, use cases, uh, uh, excuse me, sorry, no battery needs probably a charge. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll keep talking. Uh, so uh, uh, what does our SDK do? Uh, it does a few things. One is uh, we don't want every uh, developer on the platform to have to figure out uh, what is the Kafka configuration, things like broker addresses, uh, SSL. So uh, SDK uh, automates some part of that. Uh, then we have some data encryption policies uh, for uh, the Kafka topic. So uh, SDK simplifies working with that. Um, additionally, um, we also collect some matrix. Uh, like if there are any parsing errors, records are not processable, uh, those get captured uh, by default. Um, then... Uh, Let's talk about the Flink layer. Um, so Flink supports most of the uh, stateful APIs uh, Beam uh, provides. So uh, the feature parity there uh, is pretty good. Um, the other aspect of uh, running Flink applications is uh, having a, a remote store for fault tolerance, um, so we use S3 for persisting that state. And um, this layer also does some integration for forwarding uh, application matrix, uh, such as checkpoint latency, uh, uh, checkpoint duration, if there are any restarts, things of that nature. And uh, we have also built a custom component for auto-scaling, uh, which uh, optimizes for uh, 
number of partitions uh, on the Kafka input topic. And finally, uh, we have our infra layer, uh, which is uh, on AWS. Uh, on EKS, we provision a namespace for every application. Uh, that provides a logical isolation uh, for uh, hosting several applications on the same uh, multi-tenant cluster. Uh, we also get some matrix uh, from Kubernetes, uh, things like memory usage, CPU usage, that helps us find out uh, whether resources are over allocated. Uh, billing tags. Uh, uh, billing is uh, important, uh, especially in the multi-tenant uh, environment. We want to know precisely uh, how much each application application costs. Um, so uh, the namespace level isolation uh, that uh, Kubernetes provides fits uh, well with this model. Uh, and finally, uh, we have a number of Kubernetes clusters as uh, we see growth in the adoption. Uh, for the platform, uh, we had to scale beyond uh, just uh, having one Kubernetes cluster. And now uh, we have several, a fleet of clusters uh, across geographical re regions. Okay, uh, now uh, Nick showed the uh, experience of uh, the deployment, uh, let's go into deeper uh, level to see what is actually happening in the uh, deployment workflow. Um, so the first uh, step is we build a container image uh, that has your beam code and uh, all the flink dependencies. Uh, then uh, we have to provision uh, compute uh, which is EC2 instances, um, then uh, provision bucket, uh, and then allow uh, the EC2 instances to work with the bucket, so grant any necessary permissions. Additionally, uh, for encryption and decryption uh, of the records, uh, there are some permissions required uh, to enable that as well. Uh, then we generate some configs information such as uh, the Kafka broker list or uh, any application specific things like uh, the prefix on S3 uh, as generated in this phase. Uh, and then uh, the application is actually deployed on Kubernetes. Uh, and after the deployment, uh, we capture the lineage in our metadata registry, uh, which is Apache Atlas. Uh, and this uh, universal metadata registry is important part of uh, Intuit's uh, data mesh strategy. Uh, by uh, registering things in this uh, central location, it helps us uh, find answers to a lot of questions like uh, who is producing the data, what is the schema of the data, uh, which team owns this entity, uh, questions of that nature. Right. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, uh, the Flink application uh, on Kubernetes. Um, so, uh, Flink uh, deployment model fits quite well 
uh, with the uh, default Kubernetes uh, construct. So uh, we actually don't use uh, operator yet, but it's still pretty easy to uh, deploy a Flink application on Kubernetes. Um, uh, for deploying task managers, we use stateful sets. Uh, that allows us to uh, easily attach volumes, uh, which is pretty important for applications that have large amount of state. Uh, and for job managers, uh, it's just a deployment. Um, and uh, with the latest versions of Link, you can use native uh, HA. Uh, 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 in the past, you, we had to host a, a Zookeeper cluster for HA, but uh, now that's pretty simple too. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, so uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem is uh, pretty uh, easy to get started for uh, simple stateless workloads or web services. But when we are deploying um, stateful workloads with potentially large amount of state, uh, we have to look uh, past the abstraction layers and pay attention to the underlying cloud infrastructure. Um, so, this is what the uh, Kubernetes components look like uh, on just on AWS. Uh, the primary thing I want to highlight here is um, the, the nodes and how the pods are scheduled on those nodes. Um, so the topology we have uh, landed on after going through several iterations is uh, we use one auto scaling group uh, per application uh, or per namespace. Uh, and I'll go into the details of why uh, we do that. Um, the other uh, important aspect here is uh, for storing large amount of state. Um, the EBS volumes uh, are uh, are required uh, since there's no disk isolation uh, when uh, hosting several pods on a uh, given uh, instance. Uh, okay, so uh, first uh, uh, I want to talk about uh, our learnings. Uh, so when we started uh, the journey of stream processing platform, we were using SAMSA as the runner. Um, and uh, we migrated eventually off of that. And the reason for uh, that migration was SAMSA uses Kafka for uh, its fault tolerance. Uh, and since we have an in-house uh, Kafka management, uh, we have a dedicated team that does that. Uh, that was adding uh, uh, operational overhead on our uh, team. Um, so uh, that was one reason. And the other was since we use Beam, uh, our application developers didn't really have to change their code uh, at all. Maybe a little in some cases, but uh, no major changes. Um, so that, that made the decision easier. Um, the other learning we've had with Flink is um, we, uh, whenever there is a dis whenever a pod is evicted, uh, whenever a task manager pod is evicted, Flink uh, restarts the job. Uh, that causes a lot of uh, disruptions, uh, and for a lot of our use cases, SLA is critical. Um, so. Now we dedicate a instance group for every application. So there are there is no uh, disruption caused by scheduling uh, Kubernetes scheduler scheduling events. Um, 
And the uh, last uh, item here is uh, disk isolation on Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes or any uh, container orchestration tool does really good job of uh, uh, CPU and memory isolation. But uh, when we have several uh, pods on a given node, uh, the disk uh, usage can get throttled. So uh, attaching uh, separate volumes for state uh, helps us uh, achieve disk isolation. Um, and now I'll hand it off to Naga, who's going to talk about uh, Golden Signals and how this thing built. Thanks, Omkar, for showing us how it all works under the hood. Now let's go back to the top of the iceberg. Hi, hi all. My name is Naga. I'm a principal engineer at Intuit. My primary area of focus is working on the observability platform. Um, today, uh, as part of this talk, we'll primarily focus on the, the golden signals for services. So what is a service golden signal? Uh, this was first introduced as a concept by uh, in the Google SRE book. Uh, it is basically uh, <clears throat> a black box monitoring, uh, meaning symptom oriented. That is, you would know that there is an issue, but to kind of debug what exactly is an issue, you would need additional metrics, traces, and uh, logs. As part of Golden Signals, we publish uh, we publish six metrics. Uh, and we bucket them into system defined and opinionated signals. Under system defined um, signals are all the ones that are consistent for all the services that are onboarded, uh, that are uh, running in production. We measure availability, it is basically the success rate, uh, the request, number of requests that the service received over a minute window, uh, errors, anything 5xx is considered under error and then latency, the time it takes for the service to respond to a request. Uh, so we measure the TP50, 90, 95, and 99. Under the opinionated signals, uh, we measure health. The, the default way we measure it is if the service availability drops below 98%, we mark the system service as unhealthy, <clears throat> but that is something that the user can customize it. Um, and then the saturation or the utilization, uh, basically indicating how full a service is. So we have around 2,000 services running in production at Intuit. All of them uh, emit this golden signal metrics out of the box. So let's see how it all uh, works. So on the left-hand side, uh, you see a Kafka topic where there is high ca highly cardinal metrics uh, being emitted by all these services. It emits things like the, the request that it has received, uh, the response code of each of the requests. Uh, then it emits uh, who called, who was the client, what endpoint, and things like that. Uh, then we have a router component, uh, which actually reads from this uh, Kafka topic and then emits to one of the two Kafka topic. Uh, I, I have shown there as active and standby. We'll dive into the router component in a couple of slides later. Then we have the golden signal processor. So this is where we kind of aggregate the data over a minute window at a service level and publish that metric to Kafka and uh, Wavefront, which is our metrics tool. One thing I would like to highlight is uh, the way the, the materialization happens is different based on where the destination is. So that is the power of uh, the, the feature that Apache Beam provides. So for example, for the Wavefront data store, we use both early and late firing with accumulated fired panes. Whereas for the Kafka topic, we only use the late firing. Uh, the reason for that is the Wavefront uh, actually allows us to mutate the data once we emit it. Whereas the Kafka topic, it's only append only, right? Uh, so the downstream system cannot uh, handle newer version of the same data that was published few minutes back. So this, this pipeline actually processes around uh, 12K messages per second. Uh, that is in the input topic. But at the end, when it emits data out to the topic, it, it's around uh, 50 uh, messages per second with all the aggregation and things like that. 
Okay. So how do we do um, customization, right? So this is a platform that kind of works for all services entered to it, but there are cases where the users would, uh, would like to customize it. Right? So that is where the Apache Beam side input concept comes in. Uh, that is a way where you can provide additional input to your Pardo function along with your P collection. Uh, then your Pardo function can use that data to uh, based on your business need. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the default way we measure indicate whether a service is healthy or unhealthy is based on the availability threshold. Uh, that is 98%. Uh, but let's say I am a service owner, I want to be aggressive and things like that. I can actually go and customize, add a add a measure saying that okay, if my availability drops below 99%, then mark my service as unhealthy. Right. So the way the user does it is uh, we use GitOps models. So they open a PR. Um, and then when, when the PR is merged, uh, a Jenkins pipeline kicks in and uploads this configuration to an S3. The processor that you saw earlier fetches this configuration every five minutes from S3 and then uses that new configuration when it emits uh, uh, the health of that service going forward. All right, the router component. So uh, to be honest, this has nothing to do with the beam, but it is very, very important for the whole pipeline. The reason for that is uh, in the past few uh, incidents, uh, what we have seen is uh, there are cases when the pipeline is completely down and to recover from that, it takes about five to 15 minutes. What that means is uh, all the on-call engineers are flying blind for that period of time. Right. So we, we could not uh, let that happen in uh, specifically for this use case, right? So that is where the uh, the router component comes into play. It kind of mitigates all of that issue. It allows us to achieve an SLA of three minutes. And also and whenever there is a, a deployment, we can safely do it without any kind of downtime involved. So the way it works is it has two components. One is the controller and the other one is the worker. Controller is the one which is periodically monitoring the health of the system uh, by querying a uh, wavefront. And the moment it detects that the system is unhealthy, it sends a message to the worker via the Redis stream. Uh, the worker's job is to just read from one place and emit it to other place. Where it has to emit is something that the controller tells. And that's how we kind of achieve uh, the, uh, I mean, whenever there is an issue, the immediately at the top of the minute, we flip it and then the other pipeline becomes active and the older one will still be processing all the events that were uh, published before that. So this is how uh, a dashboard looks like for all the service owners. This is what, just one example. On the top, you see the health and the anomaly score. So health, as I mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a, a, a statistical number based on uh, the availability. But we also, uh, once the, the health signal and the availability numbers are published, uh, we have in-house uh, anomaly score uh, generator that actually generates this anomaly score and publishes to Wavefront as well. So anytime the anomaly score is about three, we, in, uh, we show that the system is unhealthy. Uh, the below chart shows the number of requests, number of errors, and at the end, it shows the, all the latencies uh, that this service is experiencing. With that, I'll open it up for Q&A.